Folks, welcome to the Jake Feinberg Show. I have been marinating in different regional pockets of music for quite some time. The pockets of this country where unique music developed because of culture, heritage, and a need for individuality. Of late, the great state of Louisiana has been turning round inside as I have interviewed Ellis Marsalis, Alan Toussaint, and last weekend, Leo Nocentelli. Those cats call New Orleans home. With all the beauty and bumps, they saw their individuality accentuated. They saw their families moving upward, and they knew that the whole is always greater than the sum of its parts. These are the values instilled in my guests' generation, and harder to find in younger generations like my own. The deep sense of insecurity, which is actually the path that drives you to coalesce around a group of artists who are intent on understanding, listening, and trusting in the transcendental musical experience where you leave your physical body. My guest is from Baton Rouge, Louisiana, but for reasons I have yet to uncover, wound up in the burgeoning L.A. studio scene playing bass with Delaney and Bonnie, displaying the art of the rhythm section with Jim Keltner, he himself a transplant from Tulsa. This honky-tonk soul outfit was spurred on by the original blues masters in liquid pure psychedelia, which was legal at that time. This culminated in the Festival Express, a steam locomotive rolling down the track with Rick Danko, Phil Lesh, and my guest. He can be heard in this documentary of tricksters as they careened across Canada. My guest is a decorated bass player who is in the same master discussion as Leroy Vinegar, Scott LaFaro, and John Kahn. He has a really deep pocket that allows his bandmates to settle inside, develop different themes, and sequence the ideas without being rushed. When Bill Payne auditioned my guest for the band Little Feet, he was blown away because everything the eclectic Payne threw at my guest he could handle. This jack-of-all-trades mentality led to the greatest run in that band's history along with rhythm mate Richie Hayward. Again, the art of the rhythm section at work. Swing the band and lock the groove while you're waiting for Columbus. My guest has been somewhat of a hired gun for blues rock amalgamations, looking for those Cajun Zydeco influences. Take Bobby Weir, who brought in my guest in early 1983 to play in the Midnights with rhythm mate Billy Cobham. He has worked with incredible unsung musicians his whole life, striving to create real music with his own sound. How did he acquire his own sound? He did it on the bandstand, playing with Paul Barrere and Bobby Cochran, Sam Clayton, and Chico Hamilton. He continues performing today in a new world that seems to want to dislodge from the gravity of the universe and unhinge itself. Freedom at its best and most frightening, conversely, is when there are no parameters. Throw away the charts, come up with a groove or a feel, and see where it goes. Sometimes it won't go anywhere, but when it does head out, like Ornette Coleman, Lowell George, or Yorma Kalkinen, it is unexplainable and provides the concentric unison of the circle of magic and the circle of music. Knowing the sun rises and sets for all, Kenny Gradney, welcome to the Jake Feinberg Show. Thank you, Jake. Quite a mouthful you said about the Italian, yeah. yeah, but I mean, you, sometimes you do have to pinch yourself, man, because I get a chance to talk to Kenny Grant. You know, I mean, you know, just this is for for me, uh, man. When I mean, I'm not going to pretend to know or be you, but I think you need to know that you you are blessed. I'm telling you that as someone who's blessed. I, I feel blessed. I'm I'm very fortunate to be able to make um, music uh, every day. Know, and uh, just love it. And I have no qualms about um, being a musician. It's it is it is a blessing. It, do you do you uh, do you feel um, like you say you still make it today? Uh, the spirituality in music that was palpable in the time period that I'm really going back to before I was even alive. Where's that? Where's that energy? Where's that spirituality today in music? You can still make music. You can still earn money as a career, but where is that spiritual quality of of that early seventies pocket of time? Well, it was seventies was a different time. It was the the music was was so young. It was growing for me anyway. For for a lot of people, it was, we grew up in it. I, I grew up as a musician. You know, I, I wasn't in the streets playing football and baseball. I was in the garage <laughs> with a bunch of friends playing music. Uh, for me, that's what I always did. And um, it, it's you—you 
you know, I still see a lot of kids coming up today that just, you know, have that spirit. But all they want to do is play and practice. And uh, there's a lot of them out there. It's just that the business isn't out there like it used to be, and that's the main problem. You know, the technology has moved it into a, another um, forum, so to speak, and uh, it's on another level. And uh, it's not like it was when we were kids. Growing up, you just go play clubs and everything. It, it's a little different now. How is it different? Well, it's different in the fact that um, the, the, the tour, the way we toured, is is impos- almost impossible. It's so expensive now with gas prices, you know. I remember going on the road and gas was 35 cents a gallon, right. and uh, now it's $4. So it would have to be a bunch of Trustafarians? A bunch of Trustafarians could do it. That's it. Yeah, well, you know, you get in the car, you know, and you load everybody in the car, and you go, I know some kids that I, I produced, uh, that's what they do. They get in the, get the car, and they, you know, you do 20 shows in 20 days, and that's how you, you keep it together. But, uh, so the cost of travel is definitely, I mean, and I think that that... Oh, uh, the that, cost of travel is amazing. Right. That's one thing. Yes. The main thing. And there aren't the promoters that they used to be. That's right. That's right. You know? That's, and, you're darn right about that. Foreign, yeah. All my friends are doing most of their stuff in Europe. Everyone's going to Europe to do their shows. I, that's what I'm saying, Kenny. I'm talking, I guess, beyond the business, it's, it's the appreciation part of it. It's the lack of appreciation. The, the lack of appre- like Bill Graham was a businessman and he was a tough dude, by all accounts. But he understood what was really good music. That doesn't exist amongst the business class today. They're just doing it for BS, bottom line crap. That's it. Uh, and that and and uh, you know you 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 write a song today and uh, there's nothing there and Congress mm-hmm. doesn't want to you know doesn't even want to bother about the royalties you know. Paul Williams is, you know, fighting like crazy. He's a president of uh, after and he's in there battling with these people, and they, they don't care about royalties. They're doing the same thing to the um, film industry that they're doing to the music industry. You know, you don't get your money, you don't get royalties once to wants to deal with that. All right. Well, enough, you know, listen. Um, I want to. I want to go having, back. Having having said that. Yeah. Go uh, ahead. It's still what I love to do, mm-hmm. play music. It's what I've always done. <laughs> and it's what I'm, you know, now I, I'm doing a show Saturday with uh, with some kids that I produce, great little young musicians. We're going to play at this place in L.A. called The Mint. And um, we're going to open for the guitar player for the Dave Matthews. Really nice guy. The Mint? How big is The Mint? Pardon me? How big is The Mint? The Met is a club in L.A. on Pico. It's, um, you know, it's, it's a couple of people, maybe 150 people. Not a huge place, but uh, it's a really cool blues club. And, uh, how important is it, how, how good does it feel to play with, to play with your, with younger cats? Oh, well, the, the kids I'm playing, it's a funny story. The drummer, his father used to do our uh, web show, you know, on the radio. And when he was six years old, Richie picked him up and sat him on his drums. Because the kid said he was playing drums, so Richie sat him on his drums and played with him. So we, you know, the whole band, we played with him. He just sat there and beat him every time. Every now and every year he would come in and Richie would sit him on the drums and make him play with us. Well, he's like 20 years old now. He's an amazing drummer. Really? Yeah. Oh, that's cool, man. That's cool. Oh, he's great. He's great. He's a really good kid, and I enjoy playing with him. And Richie's his hero, you know, and he's got a good, you know, he's, he's growing as a drummer, and I, I, I have fun with him. They like some really, you know, cool stuff. I produced their first album, because uh, I know if Richie was around, he'd have done it. And just, you know, honor my brother. I, I'm helping him out. I have a lot of fun with him. Um... Tell me how you uh, decided to, um, wh- why did you decide to leave Baton Rouge? And did you wind up in Southern California first? Well, here's the thing. First of all, it's not Baton Rouge, it's New Orleans. 
But it says, I mean, Wikipedia says Baton Rouge. I'll go back and correct it for the my, right. My mother says New Orleans. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'm well, going to go by what mom says. Mom says my New Orleans. My dad says New Orleans. Cheers, so. cheers. I really don't care what mm. um, My mom's from New Orleans. And uh, there was, a, you know, the migration, the whole thing in, in the 40s and the 50s. My parents migrated. My dad was in Texas. And my mom went back to um, to New Orleans for two years. And my dad, my dad kind of got ran out of Texas. My dad put a, a black disc jockey on the radio in Texas. He was in the music business, and they kind of ran him out of there. And my dad, Johnny Yoda, <laughs> came from Houston to Los Angeles and started the Bell House Rock. And my dad was in the music business doing wow. different things, promoting, managing, and he toured with a lot of different artists and kind of grew up in the middle of it, you know. And he played with Johnny Otis? Johnny Otis is like like an uncle to me. I, I grew up around him. Oh, he was like one Jesus. of my dad's best friends. Oh, my God. And, and, tell me your, and tell me your dad's name. Michael Edison Gradney Sr. Michael Edison Gradney Sr. Yeah. And so he, find, he put a black... You can find his name in Wikipedia. <laughs> I love no. Well, you know, I just was like, you know, I, I mean, yeah, it is New Orleans. But my, my but, dad produced uh, Charles Brown. I met Charles Brown when I was nine years old. My dad had a group called G, had a scene group, Gene and Eunice. They did a hit record called Poco Loco. It's like 1955, 1956. All this stuff was going on. <laughs> and I grew up in the middle of it. When I turned, I started picking up instruments, and when I was twelve, I. Started looking at the bass guitar. When I was thirteen. I uh, I really got into the bass when I was fourteen. My cousin moved into the neighborhood and, and rented me a bass. And you're playing bass. He played drums. He played guitar, and he just you know got us going. Roland Batista was my neighbor. We were in the sixth grade together. He lived at the other end of the block. Him and I and a friend of mine, that's with Sarias, we were the guitar players on the block. My cousin. Uh, my cousin is Al McKay from Earth, Wind, and Fire. Wow. Sammy wow. Davis Student's Orchestra. And we were kids growing up together, and we had a huge band, singing groups. You know, it was it was pretty wild. And we played everywhere. And we'd sneak off and go on back to Shirelles, and he got me in to audition with Pike and Tina when I was like 16, 1966, and I played with Pike and Tina from the summer of 66. They like kicked me out of the band because I didn't know a song that he said we weren't going to play. Yes, he just... And my dad had produced Ike and Tina in the 50s. So he knew my dad. Wow. And Al was playing in his band. And, uh, you know, I just... I was in L.A. bouncing around to all the stuff, hanging out, a Mavericks flat and all these different places, all these auditioning against all these different bands like the Brothers Johnson, who were called uh, Johnson Street Plus One. And, uh, I just want, I want to I want to go I want to I just you're you're throwing you're just dropping so much information. It's I, I can't even fat. This was my childhood. This is what I did as a kid. I want to get a time frame of. When you were in in competition in, in in the urban jungle of L.A., how old were you then? It was in the '60s. I'm uh, 64, so in the '60s, 61, I was 11. 62, I was 12. You know. Ma. So 66, I was 16. I played my team. In 65, I was 15, and we we sneak out down to from San Diego from L.A. We drive down to San Diego. And, and play behind the shrouds. You kids are pretty good, you know. And Al, he just, <laughs> he, he knew everybody. He just was, he was a go-getter, you know. We did all kinds of stuff as a kid. And then he just took off, and he, next thing I knew, Al was in the Watts 103rd Street Rhythm Band. This was 1968, and my oldest brother had just, was back from Vietnam. He started SIR with Ken Berry and Dolph Ren. They had one production manager, my brother. My brother worked for Forrest Hamilton. He did all the Watts Tax albums. And I was just in the middle of all of this. Right. You know? I'm so glad. Well, the spirits... The very sp fortunate. No, no, you... 
the spirits, I mean, I went back for the first time. I, I interviewed Payne over two years ago, and uh, he brings up this cat, Forrest Hamilton. And yes. he kept saying, because I asked him this question, even though I did, you know, Kenny Gradney just, to me, it's like that pocket. I don't know you personally, it's just, but I know the, that pocket. And I'm like talking to you about what, how you changed the sound of the band. Some kind of, you know, real, almost inexplainable question. And, and um, he explained how you, you had a very, uh, it was the Chico Hamilton sessions, and he was talking about Forrest, and I, and he wasn't sure if he was related to you or whether he was just someone that you you knew from the from the. Yeah, I kind of grew up with him. My brother, we lived in South Central. I, I went to Dorsey High School, and Forrest didn't live far from Dorsey. He was my brother Gabriel's real good friend. Wow. Yeah. Oh. My brother Gabriel also got me the audition for Delaney and Bonnie. He was production manager for Delaney and Bonnie. He got me. He was the main reason that my career kept going. Is he? My brother was there when um, JBL started. My brother worked for JBL when they first opened. My brother was in all this stuff. And right in the middle of all of this, my brother quit and became a federal policeman. He just was tired of the music business. Uh, you mean an F- was, FBI agent? Uh, federal police. My brother was a uh, uh, force recon sniper in Vietnam, and it kind of changed him. Yeah. He was used to sing before in the band. When he came back, he didn't want to sing anymore. He started doing all this production stuff. Wow. And, and yeah, it, and it just, you he know. became more, really more internal. Mm-hmm. He was with the Watts 103rd Street Rhythm Band. He was production manager for them. This, and, uh, That's unbelievable. Forrest That's... Hamilton was his good friend. Not and, bl- not blood Gradney family, just a friend. Mm-hmm. Grew up yeah. with him. Fort Hamilton is Chico Hamilton's son. You know who Chico Hamilton. Is. Well, I was gonna say, I was gonna bring that up uh, later yeah, because uh, was, no, well, no, because I, because I, this is like to me. Um, so you you really you grew up in L.A. from yes. your, from your okay. So this this changes the whole dynamic of it but i can we just when you when you got the gig for delaney oh, not not the gig the audition for delaney and bonnie um mm-hmm. um were there a lot of charts or was it kind of just about feel and groove i mean can you those out I, I, i'll tell you exactly what yeah. happened My, i was in the pool hall because that's what i did i was 19 i also pool because i didn't have any money my brother comes in and throws up piece of a brown paper bag with the phone number on it. And I go running for the phone. He's just smiling. I go, who is it? He goes, Delaney and Bonnie. I never heard Delaney and Bonnie. <laughs> so I called them. They said, come over. They were at this club in the valley. And it was called uh, the Brass Ring Famous Club. And I went over there. And they had finished rehearsing for the day. So Delaney, I pulled up in the car and they were walking out. Delaney handed me three records three of his albums. He goes, learn a couple of songs. I went home, I learned every song on all three albums. Came the next day at seven o'clock to, they'd been auditioning bass players for like, I don't know, a week. And they'd been there all day. So I walked in. He goes, uh, what song do you want to do? I said, I don't care. I learned all three albums. And he looked at me because Delaney was a bass player. <laughs> he was the bass player in the Shin Dogs on Shindig. Interesting. Okay? Yeah. Originally, and so I said, pick a song. So I picked a song. The band was tired. They were drunk. I jumped up. I played in a band where you danced, you did a show. I jumped the kick pet drummer's drum, and he sat up. The horn stood up. I danced across the stage, dropped down in front of Bonnie. She started dancing with me. We finished that song. We did, uh, wow. that's what my man is for. She sang one verse and stopped. She says, you got the job, Mr. Big Stuff. And that's how I get the gig. Wow, that's so cool. Wow, a beautiful story, man. Yeah, and I learned... You uh, crushed that. You crushed I, the audition, man. <laughs> yeah, I never... I didn't learn to read. I was self-taught. I was like one of those... I picked up a bass and I started playing. And I taught myself how to play it. I'd put a record on and I would learn the record just by listening to it. 
Can you talk about some of that? Um, I think it's so vital. I, you are exactly the kind of musician that I that I love to talk to because, it, to, can you talk about the, some a couple intangible things that have helped you through your career? Feel any? You've been in so many different musical settings. Um, talk about some of those intangible things because there's so many cats. Probably now, I'm not a musician, but I know my generation. You know, is you know because of the, the lack of venues and the lack of be able to put up keep a band together because of the cost and all that stuff. They're off in solo, you know. But but you know, for you it was it was uh, it was street scholar. I just want you to talk about now, that. It was something I had to do. It was just, it was in me. And I, if I didn't have my guitar in my hand, I, I was not happy. And I just, I slept with it. I, I played all the time. I, I, it's like I found myself, you know, as a kid. I actually found myself. Because I didn't know who I was until I started playing guitar. And I found myself. Then I found the first Jimi Hendrix album. And that was it. I was gone. Was it 66 or 65? And for me, music was just, you know, it was something that was always in my family. My mother was a dancer. She loved music, playing music all the time. It's a New Orleans thing. You know, I grew up in L.A., but I grew up in a Creole community. You know, it was just, it was like they were coming from New Orleans to L.A. and going back all the time. And it, it was a different world than, than uh most today. Today's an electronic world, you know. I, I think you're darn right. Well, I was going to say, did you uh, wind up crossing paths with the Crusaders? The Jazz Crusaders? Yes, sir. Yeah. Because um, because I when I I, I did, did I did two jo- two interviews with Sample, rest in peace. I interviewed Wayne, and they came from the Wayne Shorter produced. No, Chico Wayne Hamilton. Wayne Henderson. Oh. Wayne Henderson produced Chico Hamilton's album. One of them. He did. Yeah, and then they came here. My brother-in-law talks about uh, my my sister. I'm, I'm the middle child of eleven kids. I have seven sisters. <laughs> One of my sisters married uh, Ernie Barnes, who's a famous artist who painted one of Marvin Gaye's album covers. Uh, what's going on with all the dancing in the middle? And then he did one of the Jazz Crusaders album, and he did not like to do album covers, and those are the only two he ever did. Which Crusaders and, album did he do? I can't think of the name of it. No, I was just, the only reason it came to me was because Sample talked about the Creole communities in Houston. Yeah. And so it was the same yeah. thing. Yeah, and my dad was from Houston. He's from a Creole community. And his, uh, his family name, Gradney, which was Gradniego, which is a very old Italian name, was from a small city in Louisiana called uh, Mamou, <laughs> by Alexandria. And there's just tons of Gradneys here, just like Houston. There's lots of Gradneys. So it's a big, so Gradniego, and then... Gradniego, and then they change it to Gradney. But there's still Gradniegos, Gradneys everywhere. And your mother's uh, bloodlines were what? Barbara Ann. My mother's name... Maiden name is Barbara Ann, and her other's maiden name was Bolsonier. They're French Creole. French Creole. Yeah, that's how you look. <laughs> how I roll, man. <laughs> 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 you grew up with a lot. Of, so did Wilton. I think Wilton Felder had 15 sisters. The point. The point well, I just. To me, to me, the idea. Did you. Okay, I'm going to ask you a quiz question. Do you know the yeah. first cat on on record to play the electric bass? Who was the first person on record to play the electric bass? Yes. Obviously, it was tampered with, it was dealt with before, but not recorded. And I, I like when I listen to you, I, I sort of want you to... I'm wondering, because I, I remember the first the electric bass was made in, like, 50. I want to say that's that's uh that's right around the time that's right around the time that uh that he used it um well think about it we can come back to it but i i i I would think monk montgomery or somebody like that 
I don't know. Are you kidding me, Gradney? You nailed it, man. Are you kidding me? Yeah. You just pulled that one out of your hat, man? He, Art Farmer. 50, West Montgomery's brother. Monk, Montgomery. Monk Montgomery. Electric Bass 53 Art Farmer record on Prestige. Unreal. Really? Uh, unreal. Yeah, wow. first one, yeah, you know, I cannot believe. Who else were you thinking about? Uh, that's all I could think of was Monk <laughs> Montgomery. I knew George Duke was too young, and I knew Monk was... Was right around that age. George Duke know? played and, the bass uh, before the the wizard, the keyboard. And I, I knew that Ron Carter would never play an electric bass. He hated you know? it. He he did, but he yeah. hated it. He hated yeah. it. He hated it. I know because I, I, I got to speak to him. He actually, what he was. I live in Studio City now, and he would be at the driving range hitting balls. And I, and I actually. Through one of the starters, who said, "Hey, we got two bass players here." You know, we we chatted for a while, and uh, it was really nice to get to talk to him, you know, and, and bow to him, you know, and thank him. For well, that. yeah, you know, Granny, had, not to Ron was he was nice enough to grant an interview, but he, one of these cats that. Uh, you know, either you get the memo or you don't get the memo about being a good human being. Yeah. And and so, yeah. you know, I mean, I'm not going to spend a lot of time. I, I know he's a genius at what he does. I know he's really... He was a genius at, at what he he's does. He's still doing it, you know? He's still kicking ass, yeah. you know? He's, and so... And, and I know, I know, I've got to meet a lot of great bass players, you know? I'm sure. And, and I know a lot. My favorite bass player who is like the most unsung... Unsung bass player. <laughs> now I'm going into rock and roll. Here. That's fine. Who's, who's never played on a song that wasn't a hit record, and you you rarely hear people talk about him. That's John McVie, Fleetwood Mac. Mm-hmm. And here's a guy with a history. He's a dear friend of mine because I, I was in a band with Nick. Nick and John grew up in the West End. Fifteen years old. Uh, Muddy Waters and all these guys will come in. They need a rhythm section. Mick and John will play with them. <laughs> you know? <laughs> and they played with everybody. BB, they, you know, because right. these guys will come by themselves. And these. John, everything he's played on has been a hit. He, he played on uh, um, Werewolves of London. That's Nick and John playing Z- on, on Z- Zivon. Z- really? Yes. Um. So. Yeah, it's interesting because those guys that have stayed in, I mean, Leland Sklar is another guy like that. I mean, a tremendous. Yeah, Lee's, Lee's amazing. I've done like five. Inter- I've done like five interviews with Lee. Like, I, I the guy is like to me. Like, to me, he's a legend. Again, so many songs yeah. that that were made. But he, I mean, you know, uh, you know, that's sort of the job of Jake Feinberg. It's not to preserve; it's to promote. Because you guys had these unorthodox styles. On top of that. For unorthodox learning systems, and then on top of that, all the original masters were still alive and thriving. So they were, you, you could really, really interact. I mean, you, I mean, your bass playing was, I mean, by the time, do you remember uh, um, auditioning for, for Little Feet? Do you remember that day? Yeah. <laughs> because, because I listen, I'm listening. Back, was, yeah. It was at Warner Brothers Studios. They, they they would finish filming, and then they, we would. I walked into where Bill Cosby used to do the Crest toothpaste commercials, <laughs> where he slid down the tube of toothpaste, and the giant teeth were there, and he was dressed like a tube of toothpaste. We, all of this was set up, right? Right. Right. And this was seventy two, and over in the corner was was the band, and it's a gigantic stupid in a room where they filmed it. And all the bands, you go you go in the back, everybody's parked in the back. And um, when I met Lowell, there was these three girls that sat around him, you know, and this guy that I had never met, the guy turned out to be um, Jackson Brown. The three girls turned out to be Andrew Harris, Bonnie Raitt, and Linda Ronstadt. And they just sat around Lowell, you know, like... Uh, so it's how to do this, or how do we sing that, how do we do this, how do I write that? And Lowell sat there and just, he was like, teacher. We became good friends. I walked in, I'd never heard any of their music. I got a call from, from Dolph Ramp, who owned SIR. That's right. And Dolph was a good friend. Like I said, my brother opened with him. 
golf course. Kenny, there's a great man here. He got a record deal on Warner's. And they've been auditioning bass players for like two weeks. And he knew that I wasn't with Delaney and Bonnie anymore because we rehearsed them. He goes, you should check this man out. He gave me the phone number and I called the production manager. He called, gave me Billy's number. I went over to Billy's house. Billy lived on Carroll and Sunset, which is a block west of uh, Domini, right off of Sunset. I, I went in, took my bass out. He was sitting at the piano. I tuned up to the piano, and I just tuned up and went, da 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 He goes, you don't have to audition. Just come and play, just like that. He said, just come and play with us. He just heard me just tune my bass and play a few notes. And so I walked in. So what are we going to do? Oh, we have this song called Brides of Jesus. I said, okay, play it. They played it. I played it along with them. We have this other song called, uh, <laughs> you know, and I played it with them. And we just, we jammed for five hours. Oh. Lola and I were laughing and playing. We got along really well. And that was it. They didn't really audition. I just went and played with them. And I was in the band. Two weeks later, I brought Sam over. I said, Sam, come and jam with us. Just come and jam with us. They so came and jammed. He goes, I'm going to do a band with Bonnie and and uh, he had uh, Clyde King and all these girls he's going to do a band with. I said, well, we're going to go to Hawaii. He goes, really? <laughs> we're going to go. I said, we're going to do the uh, Crater Festival. He goes, okay, I'll go. <laughs> so we go to Diamond Head Crater. There's 40,000 people in the crater and we blew this place up. And he goes, that does it. I'm in this band. <laughs> and we came back to L.A. and we were going to open for someone. We played the Fox Theater in um, Venice Beach. It was a live radio show. We, were, we opened for this person and they were going to do a radio show of the school for opening for night. I'm being totally honest. I cannot remember the name of the band. Yeah, it's fine. And, and, and as soon as we started playing, they turned and they bombed and they recorded us instead. Wow. We just blew the place up. That was it. We were in Little Feet. We loved the way Lil sang, and his persona, everything. It was just, just so cool. Yeah. I mean, that's what uh, uh, Payne, was, Payne was telling me about meeting him a few years earlier before you, and just having that same, the more he got to, he came out because he wanted to connect with Frank Zappa. And uh, yeah. and then it, more the more he hung out with Lowell, and the vibe that he was like, this is just more the direction I want to go. And then I think anything Frank could do for me. So it was like uh, yeah. I just hear the band. Frank? You guys were really. Uh, I mean, it's it's. I just happen to have this live show that circulates from '73 from Ebbets Field in Denver. When I talked to Ber- yeah. when I talked to Barrer, he was talking about what time. a little club that was Ebbets Field. That's what I'm talking about, man. Dude, and you know what was so badass is you want to talk about club owners, they had, I mean, again, cost to travel. Again, we, you know, it'd be like Little Feet and then Freddie Hubbard coming in on the weekends. It's freaking ridiculous, man. I mean, you, your people's ears yeah. were wide open. You could be doing drugs or not. You're still going to be, your ears are going to be open. Yeah. Yeah, it was, it was good times. Yeah, no, I, I think, I think, I think, uh, when you look back, like, um, did you ever play the upright bass? Yes, I have a beautiful upright. So, in 1971, I wanted to, Lowell was a brown belt in Okinawa Day, and he got me into martial arts. I, I'd always wanted to learn. My hairdresser was a Philippine guy. He was from a family of 16. He had nine brothers. They were all black belts. I wanted to learn Kung Fu. He wanted to learn how to play the bass. I said, bring over your favorite record. I'll show you how I learned. He picked it up so fast. <laughs> it was stupid. It was like he was born to play. Okay? Mm. And I, I, he taught me Kung Fu for a year. We went back and forth. And um, he got really good on the bass. Then I didn't see him for months. And then I see him, and he's like, uh, I don't play electric bass anymore. I only play upright. Then a year later, I see him. He's in the Filipino orchestra. He's got an upright teacher. He goes, Kenny, you changed my life. I can never pay you back. I go to his house, he's got three upright bases. He goes, this is a copy of a Stradivarius. <laughs> so I picked that one. And I still have it today. And I play it all the time. 
I I, I, I I cannot believe you just said just that that's a real story. That's unbelievable. Yeah. And, and I, I got my fourth degree black belt in kung fu, and I work on my upright base. And he got a he got a scholarship to ST Music School. He just became a brilliant bass player. How did he, did, you know, it's interesting, just, did his demeanor change over time where he be, became more, um, like his little feet moved along into the later 70s, uh, more I'm sorry. I'm sorry, Jake. Yeah. Start that again. You lost. Yeah, no, I, uh, just, just the idea of, of Lowell's stage presence, did he become more of a recluse in, during those live shows, or in, like, the way he just went off on these tangents, Found these new he was not a he was not a recluse at all. Lowell was always out front and right there. He was Lowell, Paul, and Richie. They were like the Marx Brothers. Never have you heard one liners bounced around so fast it pulled out of the pulled out of nowhere. Right. You just sit there and laugh right. for hours. Right. Those guys were so quick, you know. Here's a perfect story of old. We're playing the Budokan in Japan. Now, there are police standing in the aisles but people don't stand up. Law is big, right? He's got his long hair. Like I said, he was a brown belt. He studied Japanese stuff and everything. He takes his shirt off takes the top of his overalls down, puts his hair up like a sumo, he's got his gut out. He walks out for the encore, <laughs> and he drops into the sumo position, and the frickin' place blew up, wow. you know? Wow. And he started doing the sumo stuff, and then he did the chant that the Japanese referee does his chant in the middle of the thing, and he starts doing his chant. Oh, and the police threw their hats up. The whole freaking place rushed the stage. And he looked like a sumo up there. He had his hair up like a sumo. And he picks up the guitar and he sings willing. And blew him up. Mm. It's one of the most amazing things I ever saw. He got them all pumped up and sang willing to him. And it just blew the pace up. People were just, he was amazed. That's the kind of guy he was. He's a real showman. No, I I really appreciate this. I mean, I'm I'm in my own little bubble, but I I, I always like I, I look at these these transcendent figures, uh, and mm -hmm. I say, and I look at some of their behavior. Uh, is just very so can, can be self destructive. But why? How did he pass away? I mean, was it self destructive, or I don't quite know what, how he left us so soon. Well. And if you don't want to yeah, go into it, it's fine. I, 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 it's just more no, my. He got, he was, you know, he had a cold. He was doing blow, and he was doing um, snack. He was snorting a little snack, but he took an antihistamine, and when he took the antihistamine, that's what got him. He took an antihistamine for his cold, and it stopped his heart. And a histamine did wow. not go with other shit he was taking. Sure, sure, that sure. That killed him. Wow. So That's he, what really hmm. got him. Oh, my Lord. I, I mean, so, but... Uh, were you... Spur but you're upright. Like, were you one of these guys that... Uh, being that you lived in Southern California, were you going to Howard Rumsey's Lighthouse to see cats? Were you ch who were the bass players that you yeah. you idolized? Like, was it LaFaro? James Chamber. James Jamerson. Well, that was Motown, though. James Jamerson was my hero. And now, here's another thing. That's awesome. At the time, at the time, you know, when I was a kid, I grew up playing Motown, James Brown, all that stuff. I heard the Hendrix blew me away. And it's not a big Beatles fan. I love the Stones. I love Zeppelin. I was not a big Beatles fan, but I loved the way Paul McCartney played bass. He was so melodic. His bass lines, paperback writer, you know, what a great bass line. <laughs> His bass lines are really melodic. He, he's a very rounded musician. He plays guitar, he plays piano, he plays bass. He's a great bass uh -huh. player. Very versatile. Oh, yeah. Very versatile. 
James Jamerson, Carol Kay, the combat leader. She did it was her and Mo and James Jamerson did all the Motown stuff. Yeah, no, the uh, Cosby called her the Mad Thumper. She was a th- she, th- yeah. she was unreal. She was amazing. She was amazing. She was amazing. Can you can you talk a little bit about uh, you know another transcendent spirit? Uh, was a, a guy that you met early on. Well, play with Delaney Bonnie. But just I, I, I just was hoping you could share share a story about uh, Jim Gordon. Wait a minute, Jim Gordon, the drummer. Uh huh. Uh, Jim Gordon, the keyboard player. Well, I love. Bo- I I really know uh, Jim Gordon, the keyboard player. I know from all these children's records. I know he was a badass player, but I'm talking about the drummer. He, the, you he know, played the, keyboards and saxophone. He was a wild man. No, it's, but, it's so uh, are all these cats. Jim, yeah. Jim Gordon, the drummer. Yeah. You mean the one that ended up in jail? The one that, that took out his mom, yeah. Yeah, with the hammer. Yeah. I didn't know him that well. <laughs> he was from, he was in Mad Dogs and English. Mm-hmm. Okay. Now, I came after Carl Riedel and all that. You came after Chuck that? Mor- okay. Chuck Morgan was the drummer that played with us. What was his name? Chuck Morgan. Chuck, is he, used, is he still around? Yeah. Wow, that's a name that does not jump out at me. So, okay, so Jim Gordon did not play on those. For some reason, I thought you guys did play on those albums, on those Delaney and Bonnie albums together. No, Jim Gordon played on Delaney and Bonnie's record. I did not play with him. Carl Radel played. Radel did, okay, got it, got it. And I met Carl, who's a great guy. Also, Tulsa product. Do you, have you seen Keltner at all? Do you, do you, do you, have you, do you play? I was it? just with Keltner. Funny story. I was just with Keltner. I love it. I love it. I love this. Go tell me a story. Well, we all have this eye doctor here in town (laughs) named Finefield. He has his own radio show. Now, he's an eye doctor, an eye surgeon. His name is Finefield? Finefield. Yeah. That is bizarre, man. But he is. I I, I hang out with Johnny (laughs) Michelle, Tony Bronagle. These are my boys. They're all Houston guys. Tony plays. They used to play together in Bonnie Raitt's band. Well, Tony plays drums with uh, Eric Burton right now. And he's in the Belushi band. He was on the new Belushi TV show. Wow. He was the drummer. He's one of my good buddies. These are all, I call them the Texas contingency. They're all from Texas. <laughs> and What's this eye doctor's uh, name again? Fly, 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 fine flyer? Uh, Bob Finefield. This is and hysterical. he always shows up there. He has a radio show and he has live shows at his house. It's his beautiful home here in the valley. Well, it was his 60th birthday. <laughs> so he had this big party and he had the band all set out and he had his guitar and he was singing. Uh, and there he is, there's, uh, what's his name on drums? Keltner. Keltner. So he's playing drums, I'm playing bass, Ron Eagle's got a set of drums he's playing. So, yeah, we were hanging out, chatting and laughing at the dock. Can I ask you a question? What, what, were you guys just... I, where are the tapes of that show, man? That's still... that. <laughs> why, it's being done at people's homes, man. <laughs> the magic- well, that's what just... He was a friend of ours. I know. And we all know him. And he hangs around the studio when we're playing. And he's just... No, I totally dig it. To me, it's just like... It's great that you guys can just... When was the first session yeah. you played with Keltner? When did you first meet Keltner, though? God, I can't even remember. I had a great, I, I mean, Keltner, man, that, see, but just to know that Gradney and Keltner, you guys are, it's just, you guys are the, the salt of the earth kind of people, man. Like, this is the kind Keltner's of... Keltner's a great guy. He's a really good guy. Down the earth guy. He was one of Richie's best friends. Do you want, yeah, no, I was going to say, you know, um, let's see, it's pretty, you really dropped the sledgehammer here. Did you, uh, what, did you also... Work with Dwayne Allman at any point? Listen, Delaney and Bonnie, dude. I'm on the anthology album, Living on the Open Road. That's what I'm saying. But was it ever. Dwayne. Here, check this out. 1970. Delaney and Bonnie. Carnegie Hall. This is a stage. From stage right to stage left. Greg Allman on Hammond. Dwayne Allman on guitar, uh, John Hammond on guitar, mm. Delaney and Bonnie, King Curtis and Richie Havens across the front of the stage. 
and I'm sitting on a stool playing bass. Chuck Morgan is playing on a leather suitcase with his sticks, and Sam is sitting on, Sam Clayton is sitting on one of the big those boxes with the hole in it, I forget what you call it, and he's playing the, the bass drum. And we're doing, you know, it's called the cajon. cajon. Yeah. From the fire. We're doing all this acoustic stuff. And then the curtain comes up after about an hour and a half. In the band, horns, Daryl Leonard, all the horns guys come out. And we did full on band. And the Almond Brothers, when I joined Delaney and Bonnie, the Almond Brothers were the opening act. And, and everywhere we went, Dwayne and Greg was there. No, I want to clear up some of the earlier stuff because the the period of time that I'm obsessed with you on is not is not I want it, so yeah some of the stuff is fuzzy for me but just the idea that, I know you were on the anthology and I know there was all this sort of mixing and, and melting going on but uh, the thing that uh, did you did you ha- did you play any stone jazz did you ever play any stone jazz gigs did you did you play any any gigs like that to to just make a buck back in the day. Yeah, I played whatever I could play back in the day. But I never, I, I can't say that I ever played jazz, because here's the thing. I, I played with my cousin and I, we had a band through the 60s. And then, 69, I started my own band. Okay? And then I had my band for about 68. For about nine months, I had my own band. And then I got into Laney and Bonnie. And then from Delaney and Bonnie, I got into Little Feet. So I really just kind of, boom, went. Never, never had to like. My when I had my band, we were working all the time. We were just playing club after club after club. Sure. All around L.A., we just and the guys in my band, uh, my drummer and his wife, she sang. He played drums. He wanted to just. He didn't want to go make a record and tour. He said, I'm just going to, we can just play the clubs in L.A. for the rest of our lives. I went, no, dude. <laughs> That's a change. People change. I said, no, I'm, I'm moving. I got to go. <laughs> so when my opportunity comes, I'm out here. And I got the audition for Delaney Bonnie and I took it and I came to work that night. He was really, late. So, well, you know, my last night. I'm out of here. And, um, you know, what happened? I went from that to Delaney and Bonnie and Carnegie Hall and the train and all that stuff that happened after that. The one thing I was hoping you could talk about um, was your experience on the the Festival Express. Uh, you know, a lot oh. of and and uh, just go go right ahead, please, because I mean there there were some. I'm sure you met a lot of the cats. Those was that the first time you met like Rick Danko and those guys like that. Yes. Mm-hmm. I never even knew who the band was. <laughs> I, 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 I came from South Central. I listened to James Brown and all that. And sure. this was my intro into rock and roll. And then I realized, I was a rock and roll bass player. That played funk, you know? And they needed me. I sat on, the first show was Toronto. And I sat on um, Levon's drum riser and sat there with my mouth open and listen to him sing, Building to Nazareth, I was feeling about a half past eight, and playing drums, I'm like, who the hell is this guy? This guy's amazing. <laughs> this band, and every time they'd finish a song, they would switch instruments. Right, you know, right. From drums <laughs> right. to, to mandolin. <laughs> and then the keyboard player would come over and play drums. It's like, these guys are amazing. And then Janice, and uh, it was... You know, and then I met Weir and Jerry, and we became the Three Musketeers on the train. Really? Yes. Oh, I love I, that you got. I Weir became really good friends right on the spot, and I, I see this beautiful girl on the train. I'm 20 years old, and I'm after her girl. This girl named Frankie. The whole tour, I'm she's just teasing me. So, <laughs> end of the tour. And we're all saying goodbye. And Bobby goes, hey, how'd you do with Frankie? I go, oh, man, she just was playing with me. He goes, good, that's my old lady. I go, well, why the hell? (laughs) Well, you had too much fun. He, what a spirit, man. We became good buddies, man. Yeah, man. That's really cool because, um, 
why do you think you got, it was just an immediate kind of thing? There, how do you account? Yeah, they're it, the same kind of people. And here's, check this out. I'm backstage with these guys on the dead stage because when they set the stage up for all the shows, for all the acts, it was a dead stage. Now, move forward into the, to the 90s when I started doing dead shows with Little Feet. I walked up on that stage and I walked right over to where Jerry's rehearsal uh, little room was because they all had their little rooms in the back of the stage, you know, curtained off. <laughs> I walked in there <laughs> Same guitar tech with the same old beat up radio, twist fatties for Jerry, sitting there. I said, Don't you ever tune the guitar? Oh, they're too Jerry, you don't worry, what's up? He's giving me a hug and it's like nothing had changed. That world did not change. It was amazing. And that's why they and that's why they Jerry were... comes in and he goes, There you are <laughs> That's why they stick I the love this, but you know what man, it's just so great because like the, to me, like when I'm driving to my daughter's to school or swim practice, mm -hmm. I'm playing like a lot of weird Jerry, uh, like early '80s stuff when Jerry was really hurting seriously, like heavily, heavily. Play, play, go go back and play the '60s and '70s stuff when they were uh, uh, like a, a folk band, a bluegrass band. Well, no, but they, there's they, something. They about, totally. There's something about there's. I love Brent as a keyboardist, and there's just something about Lesh's six string that's just. But I love the. I just love their personalities. I said these guys were, and I interviewed Bobby, and I, I yeah. ma amazingly, you know, uh, what, what's amazing to me is that my favorite period of Bobby is when really is when Al Johnson left the band, and when you came in for that period, and I and I wonder. Uh, you know, you guys cut an album, but how? He called me. He yeah. called me. He called me, uh, Johnson. Uh, he's, he, like I said, I grew up with, do you know who Roland Batista was? Roland Batista was originally the guitar player in Earth, Wind and Fire. He played with Hubert Laws and Ronnie Laws. Oh my God. I, those cats, are, those, they came from Houston? Yeah. yeah, okay. yeah right. Roland Batista and I grew up together. Oh, now, this uh, is sick. What's it, what's it? Uh, Johnson, uh, bass player. <laughs> Al Johnson. He was rolling, huh? Alfonso Johnson, yeah. Alfonso Johnson was Roland's roommate in the old days. Oh, my. He calls me up, Kenny, I got, uh, uh, would you like to play with Bob Weir in Bobby's band with Billy Cop? I said, sure, because if I got this gig in Santana, I said, oh, Santana needs a bass player? <laughs> he goes, hey, man, that's my gig. I said, I'm just kidding because I want to play with Billy Cobham anyway. <laughs> well, uh, Bobby Cochran wanted me to audition for him. And I'm like, isn't this Bob Weir's band? He goes, well, I, I want to see if you can play with Billy Cobham. I said, do you play with Billy Cobham? <laughs> he goes, well, yeah. I said, well, I play with Richie Hayward. Yeah, right. Okay? Yeah, right. And uh, he wanted me to audition. I said, no, thanks. And I hung up the phone. Well, two minutes later, um... <laughs> What's his name? My uh, the manager calls me up. Rock uh, Scully. No, no, uh, out of New York. Um, why am I blank? Yeah, name? listen, yo, it, take a take a take a water break. I got to clear some space off the recorder. Hold on, all right. John hmm. Shear calls me up. Huh. Two minutes later, he goes, Kenny, what, what's going on? I said, Who's this Bobby Cochran now? Bobby Cochran turned turned out to be a great guy. Is Eddie Cochran's name? I said, This guy wants me to audition. He goes, Kenny. You've got the gig. Don't worry about it. Learn the song. I said, okay, John, I'll do it for you. And so <laughs> I go over to Cochran's house, and he's trying to tell me how to play the songs. I said, man, just give me the notes. Oh, yeah, man. Okay? Yeah. And I started writing my own charts up. I started getting, you know, because I didn't have, like, now if I want to learn a song, I'll just bring it up on the computer. Back then, I had to get the charts. and So I just learned, I went and got the Bobby's solo stuff, and I, I learned the parts, and then I was here two weeks with Cochran, and then Bobby came in, and we played. And management, and everybody was like freaking out. Will he be able to play with Billy Cobham? I cracked up. So we're in Berkeley. First show is in Berkeley. I walk in for sound check, and we start the song. I step up onto uh Cobham's drum riser. I stood up in front of him. He stood up 
up on his drums and we're laughing at each other and we're ripping, you know, together, just ripping. And we're laughing at each other, taking Bobby's songs to a whole nother place. And Weir was just hooting and hollering on the mic. I, and then everybody like, I love took it. a big sigh of relief. I'm like, hey man, were you guys kidding me? You played with him. Of course I can play. I, I, you know, Bobby, Bobby Cochran, a little too much microman. I love him so much, but you know, like, I mean, why didn't that? It's that S stuff gets in the way of your thinking. I love Cochran. I love him, but no, I, man, I, oh man, yeah, no, it's it's uh, it, yeah, that would be. I would, I, I think I'd have the exact same reaction, but then ultimately, the, ultimately, you know what, micromanage is exactly. Exactly right. You well, no, but I also him. look at uh, Gradney. I have my finger on the pulse of that somehow in my little hermetically sealed bubble, I have my finger on the pulse of healthy musicians today and not healthy. And I just look at that and I say that that micromanagement style is not in vogue. It's not good. It's you not cannot play every instrument on stage. No. You, If you want it to sound like music, you have to give each person their freedom of expression. And if they have their freedom of expression, it's going to flow much better than if you go, no, I want you to play da-da-da-da-da. It's like, give me a break. Nah, I know. You know, let it breathe, man. Like, like treat them... Yes, you let know. it breathe. Let it happen. You let, let, let each musician's personality come out in the song. Because you can't play all the instruments. Yeah, J- Jamerson... Um, the thing about Jamerson, when I listen to your playing... Uh, uh, um, it's just the space. Well, with, I don't. I don't play anything like James. No, 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 no. But I'm, ta- I'm, ta- I'm talking well, about his talking... style. Inspired me. Yes. That the 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 air between the notes. Exactly. You know, the, the note that's not played, and that air just goes boom in your face. You know, and you go <gasps> you take a deep breath, and then boom, you hit him with the note. I, I just love that. That you know, I love that. I don't hear any bass players play like that today. Uh, they all want to play guitar. You can hear them. You know, like, what's going on? No, you're you know? the perfect person to ask, though, Kenny. I mean, I want, I'm I opening, want the I'm melody op- and yeah. the rhythm. Yeah. I want the melody and the rhythm to mesh, and I want the guitars and the keyboards out front, and I don't want to be soloing and playing all these notes to the song. Yeah. Where did that mentality change of just saying, I just want to lock the groove as opposed to needing to get all these ideas out with an instrument that's really just supposed to, you know, help lock the groove? Well, there's, a, there's a lot of bass players that still play like that. But there's there's a lot of, you know, that don't. I mean, uh, what's my man's name from the... He was perfect. You know, Ed Whistle was an amazing bass player. No, I, yeah, no I'm talking... I'm he, talking he had to play different. Here's the thing. That was a three-piece band. Right. So he had to play more. A uh, bass player for Hendrix, he had to play more because it was just the three of them. He had to push that whole melody out there as he played the part. And that, that's not easy to do either. But the whole solo thing throughout the song, for me, for me, is, is you know, is not the way I play. I, I'm a bottom guy. I like to just sit it in there and let it ride. But that, that you know, I'm no, but no, I'm not, but I don't hear a lot about him. And, and it, what I'm saying is, it just was so prevalent. It, 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 like I go back to the, the to the bass players of your generation. It's just that pocket was so unfathomably deep. And I and I, I think it also had to do with exposure. I just being able to have the patience to let something develop. And you need to have that, yeah. you know, that's the other part. I mean, you listen to Little Feet with you and Richie, you know, um, you know how to bring, great, you know how great, to bring it up, drummer. bring it down, bring it up, bring you, it, you, you know. can't, you couldn't play a lot with Richie, because right. Richie was gone, you know. <laughs> Richie took off 30 second notes on the cymbal, he was right, and you just wanted to boom, boom, you just want to hit him, and you look up and smile, you know. Couldn't overplay with him. Those guys, they were so much fun to play. That was, that Galini and Bonnie was a great band to play with. And then I didn't think I could ever do it again. And I got little feet. I was just in heaven. I, as a player, I really grew in that band. How? Uh, really, uh, musically, 
I really grew. And uh, I started playing golf in 76, January, and I became a golfaholic. We would take the, you know, two, three months, December, January, February off. I'd be playing golf all the time. One day we come home, we come to rehearsal, and this is after Lola passed, and we get together and we start to rehearse, and we would play one song, and everybody stops and turns to me. Billy comes across the stage and goes, Man, your golf is great, but your bass playing sucks right now because I hadn't touched my bass in maybe four months. Right. Four months. So I looked at him and I said, Okay. So I found uh, Jamie Font, who's an incredible bass player. He wrote this whole um, bass program. And uh, I started studying with, uh, I started going to Jamie Font School. It was uh, private tutors. And I went through a few teachers until I found the one that suited me. And I stayed with him for about three and a half years. I studied, you know, theory and all the stuff that it, and it made me realize how much I really knew because I was self-taught and I never really sat down and studied music. And I studied for three and a half years and I realized how much I really knew and I just blossomed. You know, I just, I blew up as a musician. It wow. really helped. And that, but that, that, that was like a, a point in time when you acknowledged that you needed to, that you wanted to, to, to even yeah. though you, you hadn't it finished. Was the perfect time exactly. Yeah. But you, have you always, time. yeah. How stubborn are you? Uh, I'm the middle child of 11 kids. Come on, man. Oh, uh, man. You can I'm go not to... stubborn. I'm just set my ways. Did you... Uh... I'm a... I'm a yeah. I, I'm a... I, I, I'm kind of a person who, who, who sees things and, and, you know, I'm a feeble person. You no, know? I'm a spiritual person. I'm, a, I'm, I'm not easy to get to know. I don't make friends easy. But when I make friends, they're friends for life. The friends I've, I have, I've had for, for years. They're still my friends. Um, do you think we could do um, a part two? I kind of want to wrap this up. but do you, do you Absolutely. All right. I'll, I'll be back. I'll, I'll, call, I'll, uh, we'll be, I'll call you back. You call me back today? No, no, no. I mean, I'll, let's do some email, and we'll figure out. To, we'll do it in the next few days if you're available, or if you have okay. any. All right. You teach my golf team, man. Don't be messing with my golf. <laughs> Dude, I, <laughs> you know, Kenny, honestly, you. Uh, it was. It, we, we, that was great, man. I really. Uh, it was no pretty problem. He, heavy stuff. We'll get into part two, and I'll tell you about this band Paul and I have called Bogey Five. That's all. Okay. Listen, Rocky. I'm trending very hard right now with Barrer. And you, uh, I just feel it. I mean, I'm, listen, I'm 36, man, and I'm, I'm, I'm ready to boil over right now. So, you know, we'll just keep cooking, man. Paul and I still play together. We just, we, we do a lot of benefit stuff. We're in a couple of bands. The Bogey Five is Robbie Krieger, Tony Brown Eagle, myself, Paul Barrere, and um, Steve Mullick, who Holy plays the Holy shit. This mm -hmm. is so, you guys, I'm getting you to, I, we need and, to get and, you. And up until... This year, Johnny Lang was in the band. Bless you, Gradney. Bless you, Gradney. Thank you. Yo, listen, we'll. Uh, I'll. I'll reach out to you in email. We'll. We'll set it up. Okay. All right. We'll do it again. All right, Jay. Cheers, man. Okay, go. Bye. Bye. Joined here again by great bassist Kenny Gradney. Welcome back to the program. You know, I wanted to, Kenny. I wanted to ask you. Um, sure. Can you? Can you talk about, uh, as best you know, the Creole community that your folks were raised in, in terms of where they came from and, you know, sort of the uh, communication styles of the community, drums, uh, I mean, I'm just, how, much, how familiar you are with that part of your life or the, your history? Well, you know, I didn't grow up in Louisiana, in New Orleans. I, grew, I was only born there. I grew up in Los Angeles. I grew up right in West Los, right in um, what they call South Central, uh, which was a, a really nice area when I was a kid. Uh, Slough and Crenshaw was, was was a nice area. Right on the corner was uh, St. Mary's Academy. And uh, it, was, it was nice. Everybody from, you know, kids were cool. 
you know, it wasn't like it is today. It's a lot different today out here. How, yeah, um, no, uh, I, I guess I was more more to the point there seemed to be like, I mean, your your father moved out there for work. I mean, there was just a lot of work opportunities. There was that, migra- that Gulf Coast migration out there. Oh, yes, that's true. Uh, my my father migrated out here because um, of opportunity. It was it was the same thing that uh, the the a lot of the South was migrating out of the South, and uh, a lot of people moved up to Northern America. And a lot of people came to California, and uh, my family came to California, uh, along with uh, my dad and Johnny Otis and a disc jockey named Lonnie Roshan, all moved here in the uh, late 40s. And, um, you know, built their homes here and everything, made their lives here. And my mom had me in 1950 and moved out here to Los Angeles. Thank God. <laughs> did, you, uh, did you get a chance to play with Shuggy Otis? Did I get a chance to play with him? Yes. No. No, I wouldn't have played with Shuggy Otis. Let me tell you how I met Shuggy Otis. Okay, as a kid, we, we didn't see each other. First time I saw Shiggy Otis, I was going up to Sam Clayton's house. And uh, Sam lived up Laurel Canyon, up Lookout Mountain. You know, there's a book about all the people that lived in Laurel Canyon in the 70s. And Sam lived way up at the top. And I'm going up uh, Lookout Mountain Road. And it's just a narrow street with houses on the side. It's a very narrow street. Here comes this giant Oldsmobile barreling down the hill. <laughs> I, and I, I'm in a Thunderbird. And he literally runs me into a driveway. Fortunately, I could just get out of the way and he sideswiped my car. Holy cow. Well, I get out of the car. That person gets out of the car. And I look at this guy. I look at his car as a bottle of booze, a bottle of liquor on the, on the front seat. He's drunk. And he pulls out his driver's license, and I look at it, and I go, Shuggy Otis? He said, man, you better be glad you Shuggy Otis, because I was about to break your freaking neck. You about killed me and my lady. And one time, I was going to play with him, and he got so drunk before the show that he couldn't play. And of all I ever knew of him is that he had a serious alcohol problem. Um, but we were kids. We were in our 20s back then. So I, I, I don't know what happened to him since then. That's so interesting. No, no, I I mean, he is Johnny Otis's son, right? Yes. And Johnny is a, was, a, he, you know, he was with your father. You guys were family. Johnny Otis was a wonderful man. He was a wildlife man. He had wolves. He had owls. He had all these exotic animals. He raised these really exotic pigeons, very yeah. expensive pigeons. He had all kinds of wild animals in his yard. Amazing. So fascinating. This is unbelievable. Yeah. Yeah, the, the other the thing I wanted to ask you about is... Uh, uh-huh. The, the other thing, just... Did you... When, how did you... When Not how. When did you first play with Chico Hamilton? Was it on, was it on that session, or did you have a chance to... Or when did you first see him uh, play? Well, I knew Chico. His son, Forrest Hamilton, my brother worked for. Right. Forrest Hamilton was, was a friend of the family. And my brother started working with Forrest, and Forrest started managing. Uh, he became vice president of Watch Stacks West Coast. And my brother Gabriel worked with him. And uh, I knew Forrest in the 60s when I was a kid. And as I grew up, and when I got into Little Feet, he, he you know, he said, I, I like, you know, we had a meeting and he wanted me to help his dad, you know, help his career, you know, let's do an album. And so we did. And um, we did the first one, I think, was called The Master. That's right. And, um, we did that album. That is and, one of uh, my favorite albums of all time. 
Really? I mean, I got to tell you, man, it is so raw, and it is so... <laughs> there, there, I, I actually, there's a couple of tracks, it's, it's really kind of funny, there's, there was a lot of like, you know, you know, didgeridoo kind of going, you know, I mean, as far as the two tracks sound almost exactly alike. And they're so yeah. they're so good that it doesn't matter, you know. Like they're like the most up tempo, like fuzzed out tunes. I'm like these guys were so lit up, and they were having such a good time. And we it, were so excited to be, you know. I can't even fathom far, that. He, that he, legendary. He, my brother, my bro- <laughs> I'm sorry, my brother brought me to him, and we talked about it. And then I went and talked to Lowell about it. Lowell was like, I would love to do that, you know? Yeah. And so we did one project, and it worked out really well. And we all basically came in, and Chico was like, I don't want anything written. I want us to sit down and play grooves and, and see what happens. And that's what we did. And then the next year, Ford says, you want to do another? And I said, sure. And uh, I brought a friend in on uh, guitar, and Lowell and all the guys, and it was... It was amazing. Wait a minute. Wait a minute, Greg. Wait a minute. What record is that? The second one's called The Nomad. I have never seen Nomad. Yeah, we first we did the How many copies? Can you send me a copy of that? (laughs) Pardon me? I was going to say, how many many vinyl copies do you have? I mean, I've never seen that on vinyl. Yeah, Nomad. It's there. Unbelievable. So then it was the same group. Uh-huh. Would you say it's, it was? But would you say that you incorporated more tunes the next year? Well, we did it. You wanted to do it the same way again, and we wrote some stuff. My brother was even in on some of the writing. No man. Yeah, it was quite a bit. Of course, was a really good friend. I don't him forever. My brother and him worked together forever. My oldest brother married his secretary. It was like. All in the family there. <laughs> so Richard t- Pryor used to hang around the office. This was in the 60s, all the time. All the time. And every time Forrest would come out the office, Richard would start talking to him. And Forrest would have to sit down, he'd be laughing so hard. And and Richard would be, oh, I'm trying to make sense to you. And he's just going at him with all the crazy, you know how it gets left. Like Richard. And the whole place would break up. And he would just sit there and wait to talk to Forrest. And Forrest uh, did stuff for us. <laughs> so this early years. But what what did Chico mean to music? To the, to the music scene of the West Coast? And, Chico Hamilton. Yeah. Chico Hamilton was, was one of the premier jazz drummers. He played with Miles. He played with everybody. No, I know, but I mean, like, like well, what Chico to me was an inventor in his, in his own right, you know? I mean, no, he, his resume is great, but he yeah. also was always thinking outside the box, you know? And I just wasn't sure if you saw those groups, oh, yeah. Charles Lloyd, that kind of stuff. Yeah, he was always outside the box. Yeah. He was his own person, you know? He played his own way. Yeah. Yeah, he still does. I, he's still around, isn't he? I don't think he no, my around. man, he, he passed on a couple years ago. Wow. I did the last interview with him. He was on the East Coast. 91 years old. And uh, uh-huh. he, he said... There's I knew a, he lived a long time. He's like... he's Great like he, he, You know what he said? He goes, there's a very fine line between music and noise. Mm-hmm. <laughs> That's right. So, very he, fine line. No, he... I mean, he... he, he yeah, I mean, he just he had a prolific career, prolific, and uh, and 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 to see the thing is, you really there's no mention of it's fascinating the way it was, it was it was uh-huh. uh, uh, that that the master at least the master not sure about the nomad but the master was uh, was was recorded or was uh, mastered in at Stax Volt. It was, it was on Stax release, and I guess that was a connection yeah. through Forrest. And so um, yeah. it didn't say, it just said Chico Hamilton. It didn't say Chico Hamilton with Little Feet, you, but you mm-hmm. read the back, and all you guys are given a company as credits. But you have to know who you guys are in order to know that it's Little Feet. It doesn't say Little Feet. Yeah. You'll see Gabriel grab me on there. That's my brother. Gabriel was on there? He's a, he, he put it together. He's the one that brought it to four. 
gosh. Yeah, you were on fire. Sam was on fire, and then, but I, I mean, some of the two of the tracks sound almost identical, and I just, I can't. It's, it's, yeah, it's definitely in the top ten of, of Jake Feinberg's favorite records of all time. And I just like the well, fact. Yeah, talk about the band you're playing in currently with uh, with Paul Barrere and Robbie Krieger. Oh, that that band, the Bogey Five. Yeah, we we they, we do benefits. Mostly benefits. Johnny Lang was in the band up until last year, and they moved. But uh, we do benefit stuff. We we do. It's only benefits. We don't perform, you know, anywhere. We do just a couple of shows a year. Just a uh, golf release thing we do. <laughs> you know. Okay, so I thought yeah, you because know, last we play at, like we'll play we'll play at. Uh, it's Paul, Robbie Krieger, myself, Tony Bonagle plays drums, and Steve Mullitz plays keyboard. Wow. And we'll, we'll do things for, um, for, for like our club. Uh, we belong to Woodland Hills. We do a show for them every year. We do a show for Robbie, for his, uh, Robbie does a big golf um, charity, huge charity thing every year. It's amazing. And we play for him, and uh, that's about it. Uh, Robbie Krieger. Rob, Robbie's so busy. Yeah, Robbie is so busy. He, you know, still he doesn't have time to go. He's on the road, or he's playing with someone, or he's building his studio, or he's writing his book. Or he's he's he stays busy. That's good. I mean, but so do you. I mean, that's the thing. Is like, I mean, I don't know. I mean, it, it's. I don't know how a lot of you. I just was talking to Keltner before I, I called you, and uh, you know, he was like, "I got it." He he feels guilty because he's trying to always please people. You know, that's like in his nature, and he's sometimes sometimes he's got to say no to people. He always gives him a chance, though. I yeah. think that's very important. I think that's extremely important in, in, for humanity is to always give chances. I mean, I'm still working on that too. I do charities every year. Paul and I belong to the American Airlines All-Star Band, which is to the guys, uh, Journey, uh, John Cafferty, who wrote and sang all this stuff for Eddie and the Cruisers. Sure. Uh, Loverboy, Alex Lidgerwood. We all get together and we do this thing twice a year for them, for the Susan G. Coleman Foundation. American Airlines puts on this big thing for the breast cancer every sure. year. Wow. And we play at it every year. And we started auctioning off the band. And Conoco Minolta buys us every year for a large chunk of money that all goes to the charity. And, you know, and I go, I always go up to a Sonoma every year and perform for uh, Bruce Cohen at uh, B.R. Cohen. He does the thing to do with brothers. He has a big charity up there. I've been playing at that forever. It's, you know, but you go up there, you go up there and just play, and play with those guys. Pardon me. You just, you go up there and play with them. Paul and I and Fred and and Gabe went up and played this year. We did two shows. Wow! And I've played. I've done shows with uh, with. Uh, Russ Conkel and Graham Nash and myself and uh, Finnegan, we've done a show up there. Little Feet has gone up, the entire band and done shows there. Just every year. <laughs> wow. Are you are you writing uh, music these days? Not, not right now. I'm so busy learning songs. Right. I haven't had time to write anything. Because all I've ever had to do with Little Feet songs. I have a show that we're doing in Puerto Vallarta. It's a uh, classic rock festival that I got invited to do with Skunk Baxter and Kenny Aronoff, Billy Burnett, uh, Kenny Lee Lewis from uh, Steve Miller Band. Uh, who else is going to be there? So many people going to be there. Dave Mason, hmm. Fog Hat, uh, Cheap Trick, Cars all these groups and we're doing this big show and I'm playing with a lot of uh, with Dave Mason Mickey Dolenz is going to be there and I'm learning all these different songs that I've never played before 
uh, we're gonna do some doobie stuff with uh, Skunk, <laughs> and Steve's gonna, uh, Kenny's gonna sing. He's not gonna play bass. I'm gonna play bass whenever he sings, and it's gonna be Skunk, myself, and uh, Kenny Aronoff will be a rhythm section, and and then uh, Kenny Lewis and. Um, I think the drummer from Boston, and they have a whole other section. Billy Burnett's going to be there. It'll be a big show. Kirk Fuller's coming. We're going to do Little Feet stuff. This is in December, so I'm I'm getting all this ready for that show now. That's what I was having lunch. I was in between learning songs and you call that. I totally forgot about this conversation. Yeah, no, no, it's, 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 it's good. I want to, I want to, I wanted to get back to it. Um, you know, do you see, do you work with a lot of self-taught musicians still, or do most of them come out of some sort of uh, music school? Do I work with a lot of a lot of young musicians? Self self-taught. Do I work with a lot of self-taught musicians? I, I don't ask them if they're self-taught or what. If they're good, I play with them. But. I was self-taught. I caught myself a long time. Then I went to Jamie Fon school and studied. And you know, it, it, there's a lot of great musicians out there. Self-taught, studied. Nowadays, you go online. You know, you just go online. You can study music online. You have to go nowhere. It's so easy nowadays. Yeah, but I mean, the, I'm talking more. These kids I'm playing with. The kids I'm playing with right now are really good musicians. They're really good, just natural musicians. Sure. And uh, there's another group of musicians that are all Berkeley kids that I that I sat in with. But right now I'm just trying to finish up this year. <laughs> That's all I'm doing to do this one more show, and then next year I'm doing a lot of traveling with the wife. Where and, uh, Where do you plan? What you Where are you going to go? Oh, uh, we're just. My nephew's getting married in Japan to this nice Japanese lady looking girl, and we're going to go to that. My wife's never been to Japan, so we're going to go there for about 10 days. Yeah, we're going to go to Japan, and then just too. around the United States. Yeah. Maybe back to Europe. My wife's from Europe. Can you give me your uh, uh, definition of love? Of what? Of love. De my definition of love? What is your concept of love? Uh, love of what? Love of money? No. Love of music? Love of life? These are all different concepts. What is yours? Huh? What is yours? Uh, love is not having to say you're sorry. You know, there's, uh, the four L's are leadership, love, life, and lineage. So, when you are in your life... Whether it's music or otherwise, what are what is your concept of love? You know, what is your concept of 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 how that translates on stage to make really soulful music? The music you made, the music you continue to make. I mean, but in the, in the music of Little Feet, you know, that's love. Oh, absolutely. And so that's more what I'm trying to get at is, is those, you know. It, it, it's you're not you're not in, it's all it's not just an, an individualistic thing it's a group thing. You it's know? a group effort. It's it's what kept the music together for so long was the love of the music. It's not necessarily the love of each other. Okay. No. So we now were, we got now you, we got you some, can you can you can love someone and not like them. You know what I mean? Right. Like a brother or or because you're brothers and you can love someone and not like them, but it's. The music, the love of the music, because the music is so strong and it, it has such a great effect on you as a person. You stay with it because when once you're on stage and you're playing, it's 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 that that euphoric state that that music that you want to stay there for. It's all the elements that go into each song as you build it and play it. That's what that's about. Very, that's very good. You nailed it because, because uh, even you know, pain was like, uh, you know, 
socially, you wouldn't necessarily put all the guys in little feet together and they'd all be hanging out socially, but you put them on stage and, yeah. you, you know, that's exactly and what... They, it, just, it just fits together. Yeah. It fit, okay. They all came from different worlds. Ex- Every one of yeah. us. They were all from different worlds. But I'm, uh, our, uh, the way we played fit together so well. It just, you know, it just did. Can you... T- uh, it was a blessing to, to be able to play. So yeah, no, I I uh, appreciate that you just nailed. That's a very good answer because uh, you know I just feel like I, I should have just been you know philosophically. I just feel that there's a callousness that's enveloping the world, and I'm trying to push. I'm trying to push back against that. I I mean you know this is more my just trying to be philosophically out in front. And most people don't uh-huh. want you know most people don't want to talk about these kinds of things, but yeah, uh, personal. Well, of course they are, but but ultimately that'll take away some of the hypocrisy that we see within our societies. People being, you know, yeah. if but you can't get to. I don't want to do that with lawyers and 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 media pundits and 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 and. Uh, I don't care about that. I, you know, you guys are the ones that are willing to tell me the truth, or as close to the the truth as you know it. And you know, as a journalist, that's the most important thing. For me, exactly. that's it. Yeah, you know. I, I agree. So I, I, agree. I, I, you know, I'm sorry. I didn't. I, you know, uh, you know, that's just how I feel. The um, what was Richie Hayward? Um, you know, talk about his unique style. What did he uh, contribute? Uh, or tell tell a good uh, tell a good Richie Hayward story uh, for the, for the audience. A good Richie Hayward story. I don't know any bad Richie Hayward story. <laughs> <laughs> no, one that comes Richie to mind. Was, <laughs> Richie was so well loved as a person. Everywhere. By everybody. And everybody wanted to play with him. I mean, everybody wanted to play with him. It was amazing. Uh, Jocko comes up to me. With my wife and I get married in Hawaii, and the next day we do a show, University of Hawaii, and uh, we're getting ready to go on for the encore, and John runs up to me, he looks at me and goes, can I sit in? And he's looking at Rich, he's just frothing, play with him, you know. And I told him, I never let anybody sit in, <laughs> ever, but I'll let you sit in, because you're a monster. And uh, him and Richie took off, it was amazing. It was amazing. Uh, I really enjoyed playing with Richie. I, I, I find it difficult to find drummers that, you know, of that caliber. And I like to play of that caliber. You know, Billy Cobb, uh, Big Fleetwood is of that caliber. Those guys are like amazing drummers. You know, Richie was in a world all his own. Uh, and he could play. Yeah, was it just like off the feel, his feel, his time? He just, it seems to me that just, uh... uh, His style. He he didn't play like anybody else. His style of playing was different. You know, it, it, the hardest thing, if you, if you, if you're going to audition a drummer, play me a shuffle, you know? And it's the hardest thing to play. Lowell used to tell Richie yeah. to play a 2-4 and a 4-4 four four at the same time. Oh, man. And he would come up with these incredible, he, he, you know, he could play this stuff. He could go back and forth between time signatures and never drop a beat. That, that's, yeah, okay. That's great. That, and so, so could you. So can you. <laughs> so let's look at what is, you're going to do a lot of traveling, um, what what are some things that you if you could do anything if you had the resources what it, what would you like to do musically at this point? What would I like to do musically at this point? Yeah, um, yeah. It's, it, your, your own if you could do your own thing, what would it be? Or do you don't you don't um, want to do your own thing? Well, um, I don't know. I'm just. Right now, I'm thinking about putting a band together. I'm talking with a friend of mine um, 
Eric McFadden, the guitar player, we were just chatting Saturday about putting the band together. So, you know, uh, I'm trying to find another direction. I tell you what, I, I, I've been so fortunate to have been in the same band for all these years that I, I'm, you know, I'm quite happy <laughs> right now. My wife and I are doing really well. We're just hanging in, you know, having fun. But uh, I'm thinking of putting a band together and just playing music. That's all I want to do is just play music. I'm going to put a band together and do little feet stuff, do different stuff, do uh, original music. Just keep moving forward. That's the main thing. Musically, keep moving forward. We, uh, on the Festival Express tour... Uh, yes. You, you and Weir and Garcia were uh, uh, dropping liquid acid into people's drinks? I wasn't dropping acid <laughs> in anybody's drink. But you guys were like the Merry Pranksters. No. I got dosed. I was gone. It was, Audley was on the freaking train. The crew guys, uh -huh. they were the ones that was, you know... But no one was dosing each other. We just, it was there. You know? Right, but I mean, it what kind of mischief, so what kind of mischief, you, you said you guys were causing mischief, what were you doing? I'm sorry, mischief? Yeah, you said oh, you... Oh, we, we kicked the press, we kicked the press off the train. Okay. We were having a great time, and the press came on the train and started asking all these weird questions, because the, you saw Festival Express, correct? Sure. So you saw that uh, everybody was complaining about the price of the tickets, okay? Right. And so the press wanted to know how come we were charging so much. They're like, the tickets are $14. I mean, how expensive is $14, you know? And that's when we started all the mystery. We were doing fine until the people got on board and started asking all these stupid questions. The questions... Yeah, I don't understand why they were hemming and hawing about that. Fourteen dollars for for how many hours? Of, how many hours? And of then music? the mayor. <laughs> I know the mayor was up for re-election, so he made it his campaign to uh, to get on the Americans' cases because he charged so much. The concert should be free. Like, if it was free, he wouldn't be charging us for this freaking stadium. You know. <laughs> so you it, chased. It was absurd. So Garcia got the press off the train. Garcia was a real character, wasn't he? Yeah, Jerry and I just said, get out of here. Just get the light off the train. Get, get off, out. Get out of the train. Yeah. We were having way too much fun, man. We didn't ever want that train to stop. We'd still be on that train if it was up to us. <clears throat> yeah, no, why? I guess I, I, I'm a little... How did it actually happen that it was from Canada? Just because the band was from Canada, they got they set that up. No, it's a Canadian company. It was Eaton, Ken Eaton, and uh, Eaton and Walker. Those were their two Canadian millionaires. Eaton Department Stores is huge in mm -hmm. Canada. It was like Neiman Marcus, and those two Canadian guys decided to do it. It was a great time. And that's what I thought. That's what I thought. I was just a kid. I didn't know what the hell was going on. I was just along for the ride. You know, um, I wanted to ask you one final question. Is uh, when, when was the first time you went to Griffith Park? The first time I went to Griffith Park? Yeah. I had to be a little boy. My dad took did you wind up going there? Did you wind up going there to to uh, to to hang in with the drum circles at the at the peak? You know, like in the. Oh, you mean you mean that? Oh, I didn't do that till later. I used to go and ride the merry-go-round as a child. No, no, I'm talking. I'm talking about the drum circle you know, with the drums. Oh, my brother was a congato. My brother would go and sit him. Uh, my brother Gabriel, Larry Weathersby, Tyrone Campbell, all these guys I knew. They'd all go, Adrian, and sit in the conga circle for hours. Oh, right? my God. I knew it. I knew it. I knew we were going to connect on Griffith Park. That I, that place, to me, is at its peak. They used to give you 
do that at Playa del Rey also. Back in the in the uh, early sixties. Playa del Rey they would be out on Venice Beach or Playa del Rey right along in there. And uh Griffith Park was like everybody went there and played. The Congamont Circle just got humongous. We would be there all day. I remember that distinctly. I mean that that doesn't really happen anymore. No. There's a lot of things that don't happen around here anymore. What else? What part of Arizona are you in? Tucson? Tucson. All right. <laughs> La Paloma Golf Course. Yeah, I live I live right right down the road from that, brother. Nicholas. Listen to yeah, That's see and, and Finnegan said you're I know you're a good golfer, bro. I know you are. Huh? I know you're a good golfer. I'm, I'm okay. Yeah. No. It, I love to play. Yeah, no, I don't I can't I don't have the patience for that. You don't you don't have the patience for it? Not, I don't have the patience. It keeps, no. It keeps, it keeps me in shape. I walk a lot. No, my folks are, are they're fanatical about it. You you come down to you come you come down to Arizona? I'm fanatical. Pardon? Do you come down to Arizona at all? I haven't been down there a lot, but yes, I used to come to Arizona all the time. I, I played at La Paloma. We stayed at La Paloma and, and did a concert there in Tucson. You talking about Little Feet? Yes. Paul and I played that course every day. <laughs> <laughs> Paul and I got to play golf all over the world. He's still going and playing golf everywhere. That punk. So am I. Yeah. Well, I think actually it's been being able to talk to you. I talked... I talked to Payne last night. I got to do another one with Barrera, but it's it, it's I'm really the one thing I love the most about you, uh, Little Feet especially, is just uh, how accessible you make yourselves to to everybody. Um, there's a lot of sickle. There's a lot of people around there that you know, for better or for worse, and they had sickle fans that around them that are you know protect them. I, I don't even protect them. Actually, they're hurting them. And and uh, and you guys don't put that bubble around you. And I I think you're 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 better off for it. I have nothing to hide. I have nothing to hide, nor an, or, or an ego to pet. I have neither one of those. Yeah, absolutely. But I do have a poor handicap, so I'm a golfaholic. I will admit that. Yeah, I did. I go to GAA, but I'm too busy golfing. Oh, don't, don't, tell me about tell me about playing with Finnegan. Why do you like playing with Finnegan? Do I like playing with no, Finnegan? No, why why, why? why Why? do you love playing with Mike? Mike do you know Mike Finnegan? He's the, he, that's how we got connected. Listen, Mike Finnegan is one of the coolest, <laughs> hippest guys that I know. <laughs> Things close your eyes and you go, Who, what brother is that thing? And that man can sing... He can play the keyboards. He is so down to earth. He's just one wonderful guy. And we're always at uh, Johnny Michelle's house recording. Tony Barnegal is always producing something over there, bringing the boys in. And it's just right down the street from my house, so I go there all the time to hang and see what's going on. I might go by the other day now that you mentioned it. Yeah, you should because Mike is a, he, he's a dear friend of mine. I, I I love Mike very much. He's he uh, I track you know he's so down to earth. Yeah, and you know great, so so uh, uh, so uh, just like you, you know, accessible. And uh, when I told him, I you know he's always trying to help me connect with other you know other cats, and and so uh -huh. uh, I was like, yeah, you, yeah. I'm, I'm, he's like, yeah, I, I, I'm, I'm easy. <laughs> yeah. When you called me, I just pulled my pork chop out of the oven. My eggs were perfect. I had made biscuits, and I sat down to have my brunch. And I went, no, I'm not talking right now. No, 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 no. Hey, listen. I, no, man. This. You know what? I love to cook. I love to cook. 
I need some cook. I need some cooking lessons. No, I need some cooking lessons because my 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 wife. You know, I've really lost a lot of confidence cooking. So, if you have some advice, I'll take it. You know, I I, I used to love to cook. I really lost my chops. I cook all the time. You got to be creative. You got it's it's like music. You got to you got to get out of your own way and let your mind figure out things. You know ingredients. You know what this tastes like and what that tastes like. And if you mix them together, oh man! It's like, like a, it's like a gumbo, Gradney. You know, I I know mu- music is a meal. That's what Ndugu Chancellor said. Yeah. Music is a meal. Gumbo. Listen, my mother used to make gumbo when we were kids. She'd make it at the end of the week. Take all the leftovers. Well, of course, my family was so big there was rarely any leftovers. <laughs> but you know, you take all the leftovers and you make a soup out of it, and that's what gumbo was. 